just stand here? Yeah. Lovely. Um, it's a huge pleasure to be here. I am a former president of the Yale Political Union, which was very much a copy of the, uh, the Oxford original. So uh, uh, it's a particular pleasure and, and uh, delight. I was here once many years ago when I was uh, at Yale, and I came to an event that looked like it was straight out of Evil and War. Uh, white tie and tails, sherry in the, uh, in, the, in, in the library or the office or something like that. Um, I see it seems to have changed a little bit since then, or, uh, or maybe you still do that uh, quietly on, on days when the cameras aren't <laughs> on. Um, look, what I thought I'd do is there's so much going on in the world uh, that it might be easiest for me to start off by just talking about the thing that we can't stop talking about, um, which we all want to understand better, which is how the hell did we get here? Uh, why are we in this, uh, this state of apparently broken, dysfunctional, crazy politics, depending on how you look at it. Um, and it's happening. Uh, there seems to be a competition in the United, between the United States and Great Britain as to which one has the crazier politics any given week. Um, I don't know which one is winning right now, but um, we certainly have been holding up our own pretty well uh, in, in the, on the other side of the Atlantic. So. When you think about this question of how did we get here, what explains the kind of peculiar rise of a certain kind of right-wing populism that has uh, spread in, from the United States, uh, from Br in Britain, in, through the continent, in other parts of the world? Um, there is a tendency to focus on uh, economics, um, you know, the, the, the big C, capitalism, that we're sort of living in a world in which inequalities have widened and that the middle class has stagn stagnated. And this reality, this structural reality, uh, is what is at the heart of this problem. And it's a, it's a familiar analysis because we all tend to think uh, in terms of economics. This is one of the great um, triumphs of, of economists over the last 50 or 70 years, which is that we tend to assume that every problem is explicable by the idea of man or, or, or a woman as a rational economic actor uh, responding to uh, economic incentives and disincentives, the changes in his or her economic condition. And there's clearly something to it when you look at the way in which capitalism has worked in this last 20 or 30 years, in the age of globalization and the information revolution. It's clear that fundamentally what has happened is that capitalism now overvalues and overpays, I'm using this metaphorically, um, knowledge workers and undervalues and underpays other kinds of workers. Um, knowledge workers essentially be all the, pretty much everyone in this room. You are all going to end up doing something that manipulates language, symbols, codes, or images. Uh, when, you, when, when you leave Oxford. Um, you'll become software programmers, you'll become writers, you'll become lawyers, you'll become consultants, you'll be bankers. The, you, none of you are making anything. There are a small number of people, <laughs> there are a small number of people here who will, the engineers, and that's a, that, that's a peculiar subset because even there, uh, high-end engineering is essentially now largely software driven. And therefore, what you're really doing is the, the kind of design. The, you're, you're doing the intellectual work of, it, of engineering, not the actual mechanical application. And that work tends to be massively well compensated. Over, overpaid is obviously a, a, you know, a value judgment. Um, on the other hand, work that is increasingly physical, uh, or that re remains physical, is, is, is not paid as much. You can think of this. Uh, most easily by thinking of the example of Uber. Uh, what Uber has done is it has depressed the wages of taxi drivers everywhere. By the way, there are many more taxi drivers, so this is a, this is a mixed story. You know, lots more people have the opportunity to drive cars, but their wages are depressed as a result of that uh, large supply and the largely commodification of it. That these people can be replaced. And the people who are massively well paid in, the, in, the Uber, in that Uber example are, of course, the software programmers at, Google who uh, at, Google, at Uber who designed the programs, uh, the angel investors, the people who work there, uh, or you know, maybe a few thousand people largely in the San Francisco area, right? So that 
example is a perfect illustration of what has happened in modern economics. But I want to tell you about, about a story about the other C's, not capitalism, that I think actually contribute as much to this, because there's a puzzle about why this is happening. When, for example, in a place like Denmark, income inequality is no better or worse than it was three decades ago. It's been pretty much the same. When you calculate in government transfers, income inequality in Britain has actually not changed that much. In America it has, but in large parts of Europe, income inequality uh, has not changed that much. Once again, you factor in uh, government transfers. Even without them, by the way, uh, in large parts of Northern Europe, you haven't seen a big uptick. Uh, people talk about the hollowing out of the manufacturing class, you know, this white working class. Um, but if you look at Germany, that is not a place that you think of as having hollowed out its manufacturing uh, base. And yet, there is still right-wing populism there. Um, when you think about France as a country with enormous worker protections, it really never went through the wave of uh, Thatcherite or Reaganite reforms uh, that, that happened in the Anglo-Saxon world. And yet, there is right-wing populism there. Um, Sweden, uh, you know, is not a country you'd ordinarily uh, think of as being, you know, one of rapacious capitalists and such, and still you have right-wing populism there. So what's going on? Well, the one common feature that you can find wherever you look uh, at, at this kind of populism is immigration. Where there are immigrants, there is right-wing populism of the kind I'm describing, and it is in some ways the central animating force in, a, in, in certainly in Donald Trump's election, if you think about uh, the point at which he announces his candidacy, that is when he calls Mexicans rapists. If you think about Brexit, the correlation between people voting for Brexit uh, and their views on immigration uh, is very tight. There's the largest divide between the people who vote Remain and people who vote for Brexit uh, is on immigration. On, on the other issues, there are differences, but they are more muted. Uh, and of course, if you look at the National Front in France, if you look at the AFD in, in Germany, in all these cases, there is that, that is animating. And so the second C I want to talk about is culture. Because when you ask people, when you probe further, what you discover is that there's a great fear of a, of a kind of cultural revolution that is taking place in their countries and that people want to stop this in some way. Um, and by the way, there is some basis uh, for this fear. Now, I happen to think as an immigrant that it, it is uh, unfounded or exaggerated, but the data is the data, which is in the Western world, 1975, the number of uh, immigrants as a percentage of the, of the population was about 5%. It's now about 15%. So in the, in the last 50 years, you have had an enormous expansion of immigration and a large number of people coming in to the Western world in particular. And I'll give you a sense of how this looks in historical, grand historical terms. You know, for most of human history, for most of recorded history, people were <coughs> worked, grew up, died within a mile or two of where they were born. Right? And now in the last 100 years, people have started moving. And in the last 50 years, hundreds of millions of people have moved. And they have moved largely to two places, Europe and the United States. And that is why you see this reaction. And these people increasingly come from places where they look different, they sound different, they worship different gods. And this causes cultural anxiety. Um, and that is the core part of what I think you need to understand, which explains, by the way, why almost everywhere in the world, despite the fact that it was only 10 years ago that you have had the worst economic crisis uh, since the Great Depression, a crisis largely caused by the irresponsibility of the private sector. The response of people has not been to move left, but to move right. Right-wing parties are by and large doing better uh, almost everywhere you look than left-wing parties. Why? And you, was, you were watching this in Britain right now. It is because there is a common fallacy to think in times of anxiety, people will move left economically to gain economic comfort from better safety nets, more, more uh, subsidies, better regulation, whatever. Actually, what happens is people move right culturally. They, they have a sense of, uh, of deep unease about who they are, what kind of world they're living in, and 
that sense of unease is better addressed by parties on the right in general. Um, and that explains this, ex this extraordinary phenomenon where even in bad economic times, people aren't voting their economic interests. And this is why people will often describe it as irrational. I don't think it's irrational. It's that people are privileging their cultural interests over their economic interests, which by the way, lots of rich people do as well. Lots of rich people vote for the Labour Party, which presumably will raise their taxes. Why? It's a, it's a cultural identification. And that brings me to my next C, which is class. We don't think about this, or I should say in England, class. Um, <laughs> we don't talk about it much in the United States, but we are developing a class system very much like uh, the, uh, the, uh, the United Kingdom has historically had. M maybe not the same because it's kind of a meritocratic class system, but the single biggest divide uh, in terms of people who voted for Donald Trump and who didn't is, is education. People with a college education, with, it was the single best predictor of whether you voted for Trump was whether you had, were a registered Republican. So party identification and loyalty still matters enormously. But the second most powerful uh, marker was your education level. Uh, I think the same is true with Brexit. The big divide has been education. The big di divide in terms of um, the National Front's appeal in France is the same. Um, and what has happened is you have created a new identity based on culture, uh, based on cultural, religious, social identities that is very strong because it's sort of e multiple forces layering one upon the other. What do I mean by that? Most of these people tend to be more educated versus less educated, live in cities versus rural areas, uh, work in the knowledge industry in some <laughs> way, work with their hands in some way. Um, they tend to be suspicious of the elites in these urban places versus not. Uh, there was a wonderful book called White Working Class in which a, this, uh, a, I think a Berkeley scholar talks about how working class attitudes about, you know, about rich people. And she points out, trying to explain the appeal of, uh, of Donald Trump to the white working class, um, she says, working class people like rich people. They want to be rich. What they despise are professionals. Again, most of the people in this room, most of you will grow up to be professionals. Why? Because professionals they regard as overeducated, elitist, busybodies, who think that their superior knowledge entitles them to tell you where you should live, how you should, uh, you know, what, what you should eat, what exercise you should do, you know, you should all be eating kale, you should all be doing yoga, you should all live in downtown lofts and cities. And they recoil at that, and they, recoil, and they resent the sense of cultural superiority that comes from that. But somebody who's just rich, they like. Uh, Trump used to have in his Twitter feed, I think it was, or Instagram, he would put pictures of himself in, uh, during the campaign. And there'd be this picture of him in his private plane with the gold belt buckles, um, faux gold, always with Donald Trump. Um, and there would be a big picture of a, a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken uh, or a Big Mac. And what he's si si signaling is, I'm just like you. You know, if you were rich, you'd want to have a private plane, but you'd still want to eat McDonald's, right? You're in your raw, visceral taste, you're, you and I are one. And that cultural identification uh, has been very important to explaining this extraordinary appeal that, that you know, a New York billionaire has to the working class. The final C I would point out is that we're living in an age when these, all these, these, these kind of mega identity, I think one scholar calls it, because they, each of these identities layer and reinforce the other, is reinforced by the communication uh, network that we, world that we live in, uh, in which people seek out the kind of news that they want to hear, not the news that they should or uh, some kind of you know, objective reality of it. The way I sometimes think about it is people used to listen to watch television or read a newspaper to get information. They now do it almost in the same way they go to church. They want to hear the catechism. They want, to he they want reaffirmed to themselves their core beliefs. They want to believe that they are virtuous and the other side is evil. Uh, and that sense of tribal affinity has become probably the defining feature of modern politics. So when you ask why is it that people so su strongly support Donald Trump despite everything he's done, think of it almost 
in terms of a sports analogy. You support the team you support because you have a tribal affiliation, not because it happens to be doing well or because it's executing the most perfect strategy. In fact, when it's doing badly, when your team is doing badly, it is an act of greater loyalty to support it. That tribal sense, that group sense, has come to dominate politics. There's a fascinating experiment uh, called, that sociologists had called a robber's cave ex experiment, where they took 10-year-old boys and they divided them into two groups, essentially arbitrarily. And they found within minutes of that division, people started to denigrate the other group uh, and prefer their own group. Uh, in one version of this experiment, people were given money and they were told you can either give your group, everybody gets $5, or your group can get $4, so less money, but the other guys will get only $2. Overwhelmingly, people chose to be poorer as long as the other group did even worse. You see status and competition playing this enormous role. Now, of course, you are well familiar with this because it seems to me Brexit is a drama about, you know, uh, Eton school kids and the kind of squabbles they have had for their whole lives. And so maybe in a, in a strange sense, people think of that as an archaic throwback, but that is now a window into the new political world we are all going to live in. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much for your talk and for being Pleasure. here today. Um, my first question, as many of you may expect, is about the US elections. Um, how do you think, once the primaries are over, the Democratic nominee can use the four C's that you mentioned to their advantage within the current political climate? So there's, there's a, a, it's a very good question. There, there are two, str two approaches that people have had when talking about how to, uh, how to uh, deal with Trump or any Republican. And generally they take, uh, the, the argument goes something like this, or, the, or the, um, the two strategies are something like this. The first says, look, this is a tribal election. He's gonna bring out his base, you have to bring out your base. And you have to find the candidate who excites the Democratic base. And to understand what that would mean, I, I suppose you'd look back to Democratic successes, which have tended to be when you nominate a kind of outsider who captures the imagination of the, of, the, of the party and the country. Kennedy, Clinton, even Carter, um, Obama, right? These are all relatively unknown figures who swept onto the political stage, captured the imagination of the country, and won. That when the party nominates a kind of party elder who has stood his time, waited his turn, um, doesn't go so well. Walter Mondale, John Kerry, Hillary Clinton, and obviously that, that would suggest Joe Biden has an uphill struggle, not necessarily to get the nomination, but once you get the nomination to win. The second strategy says, look, what you really have to do is find those persuadable voters in the five states that are the swing states, and it's all gonna be about getting those small numbers of people who voted for um, Trump last time but had voted for Obama or historically Democrats or whatever to come back to the Democratic Party or to, uh, or to go move away from Trump. Um, I think you have to really dig down into the deta details to be sure which way to, you know, to, to look at it. Um, my gut is there aren't those many persuadables left in America. I think that you know, there's a large number of people who are independent. <coughs> But I think that if you drill down, what you discover is they call themselves independent, but they vote predictably Republican or Democrat uh, or Democratic. And so my guess is that I would tend to imagine that you have to find somebody who captures the imagination of the party and the country. You know, there's a saying, um, uh, Democrats need to fall in love, Republicans need to fall in line. And it's somewhat true. The Republican Party is quite hier hierarchical, authoritarian, if whatever word you want to use. But basically, you know, think of it this way. Um, there were 16 people running against Donald Trump. The they all said Trump is the, the most bizarre alien creature. He's not a conservative. He's not a Republican. He gets the nomination. He has the highest approval rating in the Republican Party ever. You know, 90 plus percent Republicans v voted for him. So there's enormous party discipline on that side. Um, on the Democratic side, I think you do need a little bit more uh, 
uh, honey uh, and not just, uh, not just the whip. Recently, you also described the US presidency as being in danger of essentially becoming an elected, di an elected dictatorship. Um, what do you think the focus should be in 2020 to address these institutional failings within US democracy and to, to save the democratic character of the US? You know, it's a, ve it's a very good question uh, because I'm not sure the public cares as much as it should. Um, you know, Americans venerate their founding fathers in a way that I think many other countries might find a little bizarre. You know, when we think about a question about, you know, whether, uh, the, how to deal with uh, illegal drugs, pe people routinely say, well, James Madison would have said this, or, you know, <laughs> Thomas Jefferson would have said that. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm guessing that in, in the Oxford Union, a lot of people don't say, well, what would Charles James Fox have said about this? Or what would the, what would the elder Pitt have said about this? <laughs> Um, and, and, and we do it because there is a feeling that they created this extraordinary experiment in democracy that has worked and survived and, and flourished, and, and I share that admiration. If you would ask one of the founding fathers, I think with the ex possible exception of Alexander Hamilton, what most surprises them about, the mo about modern America, about the, particularly the government, I think without question it would be the power of the presidency. The president was very much one of three branches. Congress was clearly the, the superior branch. Um, th the Supreme Court didn't even have judicial review into the original founding charter. So the extraordinary growth of the president, where he has tens and tens upon thousands of people uh, working for him, uh, you know, can essentially, at this point, post 9-11, the president can go to war at whim, arrest people at whim, and ex execute American citizens without due process if he claims they are terrorists. There's an extraordinary collection of powers for the presidency to have. And then you have Trump um, using them in a way that essentially says there is no check on me. Um, by refusing to send you know, White House officials to, tes to testify, refusing to hand over documents. Um, it, it shows you perhaps that there is a kind of an inherent flaw. I'm not even sure I'd call it a flaw in, in the constitutional structure, but you know, constitutions are, are basically based on something of a bluff. And the bluff is that when you are asked to, you will comply with these abstract laws and ideas, right? Because the Supreme Court doesn't have an army. Congress doesn't have an army. Congress has a sergeant at arms and it actually has a jail cell that was last used, I think, in the 1930s. Basically, it depends on the executive branch to execute to fulfill um, its, its dictats. And that, that's part of the functioning of the system is that the executive branch fulfills congressional uh, edict, edicts and acts, even though it may disagree with them. What if Trump simply says he won't? I mean, he's given every indication of that. You know, it's very difficult. It's a, very, it's a different situation from Nixon when the Supreme Court ruled that Nixon had to hand over those tapes. Instantly, it was clear he was going to hand over the tapes. I mean, there was no doubt that that was going to happen. I wonder what happens going forward. Now, the question you ask, I, I don't know, is can you make this a big electoral issue? Does the public care enough about something that sounds somewhat archaic, you know, separation of powers, uh, you know, their executive uh, 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 prerogatives, things like that? I don't know. I think it should, and I think it's worth trying. Uh, and I, but I think, you know, maybe if you, it's so, so much of politics is how, how you couch it and whether you can uh, make people understand the stakes. You know, I think uh, if somebody pers persuasive enough could explain that this really is turning the presidency into a monarchy and turning it into an elected dictatorship, that this is, this is deeply un-American, maybe it would work. Um, you also spoke about the creep of right-wing populism and authoritarianism, authoritarianism around the world. In the coming decade, do you see any path that leaders can take around the world to, to reverse this creep? You know, to me, the most fascinating part about the rise of this right-wing populism uh, is when it's happening in places that are not affected by immigration in quite the same way and not affected by the economic issues that we were discussing in the same way. So you take a place like uh, Brazil or India, where you are seeing uh, versions of the same thing. So what is, what is similar? What is similar in all these places is this sense in which there has become a kind of great divide 
that is essentially based on education and geography, where people who live in cities, who are better educated, have adopted a kind of more cosmopolitan worldview that you know, is more liberal and are seen as out of touch by the somewhat lesser educated uh, people in rural areas. That tends to be, that has tended to be a remarkable uh, um, factor that can be galvanized by smart, charismatic politicians, uh, whether they're dictators or, or Democrats, by the way, and used very effectively. So Bolsonaro in Brazil has played on exactly this, these same themes. Modi in India, uh, Erdogan in Turkey. To a certain extent, Xi and Putin in China and Russia, even though they are, as I said, not, not elected. Um, and that seems to me to represent something, again, real and fundamental. We are living in a world where there is this great <coughs> sorting that is taking place based on education, based on geography. The cities are becoming the economic centers uh, in a way that is much more dramatic than it was in the past. I know the data from uh, America, but I think it's true almost everywhere. Since the Great Recession, since 2010, 50 percent of the job growth in the United States has taken place in 20 cities. Think about that. America has hundreds and hundreds of cities. 50 percent of the job growth has taken place in just 20 places. Uh, and so when you have that kind of geographic concentration, what you are seeing is a kind of backlash uh, which can be exploited. Um, and I don't know what you do about it because this is a kind of big structural factor. You know, if you look at one of the things that Republicans uh, are now trying to advocate is to break up this federal government and move it out of Washington and have various departments uh, move into other you know, parts of the, of the country. I, I'm not sure it'll actually happen, but it, it, it comes out of that desire to say, why should all these people, they go to Washington, they all live together, they all become liberals, and they all become what is, the, what they, what is now called the deep state. You know, send, them, send them to Nebraska and Georgia and wherever else, and, uh, and maybe they'll be, you know, they'll, the, the politics of those, of those areas will rub off on them. Uh, I'm not so sure because the cities in those, in those states, by the way, are ten trending liberal as well. So you may look at Georgia, Atlanta within Georgia is actually the most liberal part of Georgia and so on, uh, Dallas in, in Texas. So these are, you know, I think we're living in a, in a time of, great, of greater cultural and demographic change than people realize. And there is a deep unease uh, about that, in some cases a backlash to it. And that that is the fundamental political uh, narrative of our age. And people who understand it and write it are able to do it longer than you might think. You know, the liberals always think, well, the multicultural world is upon us. Well, not yet, really. You know, the, America is still 65% white, I think, maybe 70% maybe white. And as long as those people vote more, and if they vote on their identity, um, you know, it can, it's, it's, it's hard to figure out which one is going to work. Um, liberals comfort themselves that in the long run, you know, the country will be majority, minority, and such. Well, you know, as Keynes said, in the long run, we'll all be dead. <laughs> And with the rise of a bipolar world order with the US and China, how do you envision the role of <coughs> established powers like Europe and then emerging powers like India in responding to global challenges in the next decade? So if this weren't complicated enough, these domestic political revolutions are taking place at the same time that we are experiencing a geopolitical revolution. Because this is really a once in a several century event, the, the rise of China. Um, broadly speaking, since the Industrial Revolution, really before that, since the Scientific Revolution, which is really around the time of the Renaissance, um, the West has dominated the world, um, militarily, technologically, and th therefore politically and militarily. The rise of China is the first big shift in that regard. Um, the rise of Japan might have done it, but it was aborted. Uh, mercifully in the, th in the 30s and 40s, uh, and then China has risen as a Western protectorate and ally. So China is really the first non-Western power to become fully equal, and it is rising, it has risen to enormous power. It's the second largest economy in the world already, 
So no matter what the, f the future tra trajectory, it's already uh, essentially a kind of, uh, you know, one of the world's major powers. And it has, it has grown up outside the Western liberal international order. Not opposed to it, but largely outside it. Uh, if you think about where it starts, Mao's China is totally revolutionary, determined to tear, tear everything down. China has actually moderated its views enormously over the last 30 or 40 years. But still, it is an uneasy fit. And I think it's going to be one of the great challenges of geopolitics to find a way for the established powers, and this is not just the United States, though, though certainly a large part of it, it is the, the case for the United States, to accommodate China where it seems uh, necessary and important so that it feels that it has a, a seat at the table, uh, to use that metaphor, but to deter it and to contain it where it is trying to be a disruptive spoiler, uh, where it is trying to water down conceptions of you know, human rights or, or um, uh, you know, uh, fair play with, in economic terms, where it wants to pursue a mercantilist policy while at the same time profiting from the more liberal policies of the, of the, of the Western order. And getting that balance right of accommodating China uh, in, you know, where, where it needs to be accommodated and deterring and containing where it needs to be deterred and contained is going to be a very big challenge because this is not like the Soviet Union. This is not a black and white situation. The Soviet Union was a non-player economically. China is the second largest economy in the world. If you go to Asia, it is the largest trading partner of every Asian country except Bhutan. If you go to Latin America, China is the largest trading partner of most, many Latin American countries. So you are, countries are going to want to find a way to align themselves with China economically, even if they would rather align themselves with the United States politically. And that gray zone of how to play these two things simultaneously is going to be the great challenge of statecraft for the next generation. And within Asia, how do you see the emerging power of India playing out in conjunction with, with China rising to such a position in the global order? India's greatest problem is it is not emerging enough. Um, it likes to think that it's an emerging power, and of course, you know, it has grown pr uh, qu quite impressively over the last 20 years, given where it was coming from. But it has nothing, it has had nothing like China's breakout growth. Uh, and it's important to understand that. You know, I, have, I grew up in India, many, many, if friends in India 20 years ago would tell me, oh, don't worry, India is going to overtake China. And I used to say to them, okay, explain this to me. Indians are supposed to be good at math, right? Um, which is, by the way, a misnomer, obviously. Um, uh, but if China is growing at, you know, one and a half times the speed of India, uh, its economy is already twice the size of India's, how is how are those lines going to meet? You know, would you do the compound arithmetic for me, which which makes this happen? So China's economy is now essentially five times the size of India's. Um, India is not going to be a counterweight to China. India could play a part as part of a coalition of countries, um, but even there, India has tended to be much too self-absorbed and and self-obsessed. It's not looking out into its into a, at its region, at its neighborhood, and asking itself what it should do, uh, how it should align itself. It's been deeply suspicious, for example, of the alliance with the United States, which it would never call an alliance, uh, because of old fears about neo-colonialism and, and you know third world non-alignment and such. So you don't see in India a kind of strategic impulse. You don't see in India the economic weight that would allow it to be a counter to, uh, to, to China. What is more likely to happen in Asia is a kind of coalition of Japan, South Korea, India, Australia, helped enormously and shaped enormously by the United States. But again, these countries are going to have to play it very carefully. Australia is a good example. Australia has gone 27 years, I think, without a recession. Do you know why? One word, China. It sells enormous amounts of goods to China, mostly raw materials uh, and en energy. So it's going to want to maintain that economic relationship while at the same time maintaining a political relationship with the United States. Now, can it do that? You know, each side, the Chinese side and the American side, are both going to try to, to say, no, 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 it's a one, you know, this is a package deal. Uh, 
If you're with us politically, you have to be with us economically. Look at Trump on Huawei and on tech, Chinese technology. He says, if you want, America, you want to be an American ally, you have to accept our views on Chinese technology and such. And most European countries have said, no, 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 we're American allies, but we like the Huawei phone. Right? And that is more likely than not. The, you know, this is why I say it's going to be a very mixed gray zone that we are operating in. And my final question before opening this up to the audience is about the political situation between China and Hong Kong. With tensions mounting between Beijing and the newly elected Hong Kong government, how do you see a resolution to these frictions forming? I was at, an, a, uh, at a meeting of very senior American uh, strategists um, over the summer m focused on China. And almost all of them expected and predicted that the Chinese government would not be able to tolerate this. You know, millions of people creating disorder in one of their most iconic cities uh, and that they would in some way or the other go in. Um, so I think what's extraordinary is that the Chinese government has not done that that the Chinese government recognizes uh, that it would be very costly to do something like that. Um, I think that we are now in an almost classic standoff where the demonstrators say that they want essentially real democracy in Hong Kong. And there's good polling evidence between both opinion polls and the results of the last elections, the, the uh, municipal elections, that suggests that there's broad public support for them. Um, they are not going to get their, those, those demands met, if that is the demand. The Chinese government is not going to give you know, democracy in Hong Kong. And yet, they seem deeply reluctant to actually go in and crack down. And so the demonstrators aren't going away, the demands aren't going to be met, the, the troops aren't going in. Can this go on forever? Well, I mean, the people who are paying the price are the people in Hong Kong, obviously. You know, the Hong Kong's economy is in, in, in shatter, in tatters, there's a recession. Um, I gather, you know, the, the, the Hong Kong Disneyland as a, as a kind of uh, metaphor is essentially an a, a empty ghost town now. Um, so, you know, is it possible that China can just wait this out and feel like at some point there will be a greater sense that um, people will want a return to normalcy, people will want a return to normal economic activity. Uh, they, ha they have made some concessions. You know, the bill, the offending bill, has been withdrawn and essentially has been withdrawn permanently. Possibly Carrie Lam, the, the chief executive of Hong Kong, could resign. But it doesn't seem like that would satisfy the demonstrators. And as, as I say, the last election suggests they have broad-scale support. What China has to grapple with is this. In Hong Kong and Taiwan, both, Taiwan has elections coming up in, in February. It seems as though China has the ability to prevail militarily, but it has lost these places politically. Uh, in other words, that if you w at this point, one in 10 Taiwanese uh, wants uh, to be unified with, chi with China. Uh, the number in Hong Kong seems to be somewhat similar. 80% um, 80, 80 seem to support the pro protesters' demands. So what would they be gaining if they were to go into a city like uh, Hong Kong or a place like Taiwan? Uh, presumably there would be mass immigration. Uh, people would flee the country. The economy would collapse. You know, they would be, they would be presiding over a kind of uh, angry uh, prison camp, as it were. I mean, I'm exaggerating slightly, but, but it, it's not exa it's, it'd be a pyrrhic victory if there ever were one. And again, I think the Chinese seem to, re the main, mainland Chinese uh, seem to realize that. <laughs> Compounding this dynamic, by the way, in the case of Hong Kong, is the fact that the mainland Chinese, average Chinese person's view of Hong Kong is these are kind of rich, spoiled brats, right? They didn't have to go through the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, any of Mao's craziness. They're, they're, they're much, much richer than people on the mainland. And now that's not enough for them, right? They want, they want more. Um, so the, 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 you know, the, the dynamic of Xi Jinping were to crack down on the mainland is in China, it might actually be popular. Um, but so far, they have tended to continue the strategy that they have had toward Hong Kong and Taiwan, which is a kind of a, a slow salami style uh, erosion of, uh, of autonomy and, and freedom in the hope that in the long run, uh, 
uh, time is on their side. Uh, but I'm not sure. It seems as though with every year, the Taiwanese and the Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kongers get more of a sense of independence, not less. Thank you. Um, we'll be opening up questions to the floor now. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone to come to you. Um, can we go to the hand at the end over there, please? Hi, uh, first of all, thank you very much for coming and speaking with us today. Um, not too long ago, you produced a special episode of your show titled State of Hate, which tracked the history of the white supremacy movements in the United States. My question is on that and kind of in two parts. First, I was wondering if you might expand a little bit on the thought process and research that went into that episode. And additionally, I was wondering if you believed that it was an influencing factor in this rising tide of populism that you talked about today. Um, Yes, so the reason I did that, it's a, it was a, it was a, uh, a, a special uh, hour-long documentary on, uh, on CNN that we did that I sort of wanted to call the return of white supremacy to remind people that, you know, this is not, this is not new, you know, in the 1920s or 1890s, the, the, these ideas were uh, animating the Western world, particularly the Anglo-Saxon world. Um, and I was somewhat reluctant to do it because I've not wanted to, as somebody who's not white, I did not want to go there in a sense because it felt like I, I knew it would trigger you know, huge reaction um, and that I would, you know, my Twitter feed would be full of nasty comments, which it was, by the way. Um, but I became increasingly convinced that you couldn't talk about the rise of this right-wing populism without getting at the issue of race that you know, when we talk about culture, when we talk about religion, what we, you know, the, the most politically charged aspect of this is race. Um, and when you looked at the movements in uh, the United States that were rising, uh, violent movements, they described themselves very clearly as white nationalist or white supremacist movements. Um, they talk in great, with great passion about what they call the great replacement. And the great replacement is this idea that they are going to be replaced by a sea of you know, brown-skinned and black-skinned people who are going to swarm through the country and destroy the culture. So um, this is, if you remember, the char chant at Mar in Charlottesville was, the Jews shall not replace us. Um, so it became something I couldn't get away from. And once you started digging into it, what you discovered was that there was you know, kind of under the radar screen, under the, the mainstream culture, there's this deep, uh, powerful strain of it, networks, organizations, contacts, books, pamphlets that were animating people like Timothy McVeigh, the guy who blew up the, the Oklahoma City bombing, uh, the Charlottesville marchers, uh, and that, you know, this is obviously the most extreme str of, a, of, a, of a certain kind of strain, but it's growing. It's much more violent than it was in the past. Uh, and you know, it's something that people need to, st to start focusing on. It is the single biggest uh, um, force right now killing Americans in terms of domestic terrorism, much larger than Islamic terrorism. Um, and, and I think that what surprised me was the degree to which this fear, this demographic fear um, plays into it. Because it's, you know, it, I, I, th I look at it and I think it's so obviously um, untrue or wildly exaggerated. I mean, you know, the United States of all places has this extraordinary history of assimilating people. Um, that we're all going to end up in some kind of, you know, mestizo, mongrel, mongrelized race in the United States. Um, that the immigrants come in and become very patriotic Americans, but the, you know the racial part seems to be the one obstacle to making people think this way. And look, there are, you know, there are psychological experiments that, that look at this. It's one of the strangest things to me because race is so much a social construct. I mean, I had this uh, debate with the guy who was a white nationalist leader and I, he was explaining to me why you know, America should be for Caucasians only or the Caucasians should secede. And I pointed out to him that I was actually more Caucasian than he was since I came from the Caucasus. I mean, India <laughs> is much closer to the Caucasus than the United States. And you know, the other word they often use is Aryan. Aryan is another Indian term. It comes from Northern Indians. This Aryan invasion of India took place in 
4000 BC, um, we were taught in, in, in school in, in India. But it didn't persuade him at all. He said, you know you're not white, and I know I'm white. And that was the <laughs> end of it. Uh, um. Um, can we go to the hand right there in the seat? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, on this background of uh, authoritarian uh, race, there is one example, at least one example, that stands out. And last year, there was a Velvet Revolution in post-Soviet country, Armenia. But interestingly, also, Armenia is under strong Russian influence, like economically and uh, politically. It's a uh, member to Euro uh, Eurasian Economic Union and also Collective Security Treaty Organization. So I wonder what is your take, why it occurred under strong Russian watchful eye, and what is the future of democracy in Armenia. And also related to that, is it a topic uh, you might cover on TV, on your show? <laughs> <laughs> a diplomat. Um, so you, you ask a good question. Um, I think it's important to remember when you describe these broad trends, that it, uh, obviously not everything always works out in quite that way. So we look at the broad trend I'm describing and then you ask yourself a much bigger interesting question is why did Emmanuel Macron get elected in France? Well, Macron's great talent was that he was able to present himself as an outsider, outside of a political establishment that was regarded as you know, corrupt, self-dealing. And that fact, the fact that he was both a very skilled politician and a, clearly an outsider, allowed him to, to go through, but even though his views on, on policy are essentially quite mainstream, neoliberal in some sense, and you would have thought that that would be discredited. Uh, Justin Trudeau, you know, similar kind of trajectory. So when you look at a place like Armenia, you, the thing one has to remember is um, each of these countries is going through their own historical cycle. So in the case of Armenia, I think there is a certain, there, there has been a certain frustration with the old order, which was seen as corrupt, and in many of these countries, the corruption plays a very, very large role in terms of producing a backlash. You're seeing this in Iran right now, in Iraq. Um, you know, so if you can tie yourself to that force, then oftentimes you can, you can produce some kind of a, a, a backlash and use it to your advantage. The, the Russian influence, look, I think in part maybe because of the Russian influence, in other words, because there is a sense that Armenia has not been allowed to have its own political life, that you can, that you have a kind of reaction to it. Um, Russia is not right now seem likely to invade its neighbors as much as it did in the past. So I think that you know the it, the Armenians' situation is not is not likely to spiral out of control like that. Um, but in you know often these places have their own in individual history and an individual political cycle that doesn't completely accord with the larger trend, even if the larger trend is real. As to whether or not I'd cover it, I mean, I hate to put it to you this way because obviously you come from there. Armenia is a very small country. Um, I've got one hour to cover the world. Uh, there was a time when, because of Nagorno-Karabakh, it was, it was very important. Um, right now, the situation between Armenia and Azerbaijan seems to be at least not, ver you know, not, not spiraling downwards. So. In some ways, you should be glad. When, when, when I cover a small country that is unimportant economically and politically, it means things are going very badly. <laughs> um, could we go to the hand over there by the fireplace? Wonderful, thank you. Um, I was just going to weigh in there a bit. You've already started to talk about a possibly emerging new bipolar world order, but it seems to me that the real question is whether we see the current strain of US isolationism that, that really seems to me a, a return to pre-World War II habits of the US as, as Henry Kissinger traces them, right? Um, whether we see that, that we've, that started under the Obama administration, but of course now it's become much stronger under the Trump administration, America first, and um, retreat from Syria, abandonment of allies and all that. Do you even think that the US is still interested, and by the US I mean not a political establishment, but the majority of United States citizens who vote for the president, are they even still interested in being part of the world order at all as a bipolar or unipolar hegemon? Thank you. Um, 
you know, it's a, it's a very good question and it's a complicated question because I think that I'm not sure how many people ever, ever um, wanted their country to be a kind of great world power, a superpower particularly. You know, I think E.M. Forster once wrote a book, uh, had, had a phrase about the man in the Clapham omnibus and whether the man in the Clapham omnibus wanted, uh, you know, British, the, the, the great glories of the British Empire. Um, certainly, at least in Britain, you had, you know, poets like Tennyson and Kipling writing, writing paeans to, to imperialism. That certainly has never been true in the United States. The Americans were never interested in, in, in they, they always viewed the world with some suspicion. They had, in a sense, become American to escape the great power conflicts of Europe. Uh, and so it's understandable that there has always been this kind of healthy suspicion, uh, I say healthy from the American context, of just engaging in the world. It's the Great Depression, rise of fascism, World War II, and then the Cold War that gets the United States into the world in, as a, you know, in the way that it be, got in, in, involved. Even, by the way, remember, after World War II, the United States was ready to demobilize, and it was really, the Soviet in, 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 you know, incursions into Greece and Turkey and then the Korean War, which changes all that. So it took a lot to get the United States to become a superpower. Its natural incl inclination might well be uh, more isolationist. But I think that there are enough Americans who understand that the world is a complicated, messy place, that the United States plays an enormously stabilizing order. Um, and I think that it's quite possible that if you had a different president, you would have, some, you would have a return to a much more constructive American role in the world. Um, I sometimes think that people lump together the Obama and the, and the Trump um, attitudes uh, unfairly. It's true that Obama, in fact, second, second Bush administration uh, were, had started to pull back. This is all a response to the Iraq war and how badly it went. But I think to look at Obama, who you know, signed the Paris Accord, uh, negotiated the Iran deal, um, was trying to, to, in all kinds of ways, further international cooperation, and made an enormous pivot to Asia, where he was adding military uh, uh, bases and personnel to restrain China, um, in the same light as, as Trump, because they both wanted to kind of stay away from the Middle East, uh, is, I think, unfair. I think that. You know, the common thread there is Americans tend to think that, you know, there's, there's no good that comes from great American involvement in the Middle East. That there is no, there are no good guys to, to root for. And that you're, the best thing you can do is to, you know, take, take a kind of uh, watch, a watchful and, and, uh, and kind of cautious attitude. Uh, but I do think that the United States will be able to re-engage with the world. The, the challenge is that this is a very crucial period and you, the world is moving on. And so it, it, my fear is that, could you imagine a situation where the United States is ready to re-engage, say five years from now, if Trump has a second term, but by then the world has moved on. You know, there, there, there is already a new um, negotiation and relationship with, uh, with China, and more, most importantly, that we have moved from a kind of alliance and values-based world to a transactional world, which is really Trump's fundamental impulse, is entirely transactional. And the core belief of the international order that was put in place by Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman was that it was essentially based on uh, rules, norms, values, and it was undergirded by this great Western alliance. And if you lose that, it's a little bit like Humpty Dumpty. I'm not sure you can very easily put it back together. We have time for one final question. Could we go to the hand in the very back? Hello. Uh, this draws from a comment that you made earlier in your speech about the rise of uh, the professional and the knowledge worker actually creating a bigger chasm in the political opinions of the population. In India, however, in particular, you observe the exact opposite. With the rise of the so-called, as the Indian media would put it, the aspirational class, you seem to have a 
higher probability of the right wing parties gaining leverage. The average knowledge worker in India seems to be way more right wing than their Western counterparts. How do you explain this? What do you think is the cause as somebody who has grown up in pre liberalization India? You know, as I said, I, I, w with, when you have these broad trends, you don't want to try to over apply them. Each, each situation is, is uh, unusual. For example, you know, Brexit is a peculiarly English phenomenon because England has had its obsession with the continent for, you know, forever. I mean, you read Shakespeare's Richard II and, you know, the John of Gaunt is going on about how terrible the, the continent is and how England says it's a scepter dial separate from the continent, right? So in India, th there are several <laughs> dynamics at work. Um, the, the dynamic that I think is familiar is Modi's ability to say, I am not like the old secular uh, urban elites that have governed India for the last uh, 50 or 60 years. I am a man of the people. And in that sense, he is identifying with this broader uh, group of people who are outside of the old elite. And they are, as you say, new, a new aspirational class. And in economic terms, they might be doing quite well, but in cultural terms, they are still regarded as outsiders. And so that dynamic of the insider versus the outsider, and, on, and whether it's Erdogan or, or uh, Modi, and in this respect, Turkey and India are very similar, identifying with the, that new aspirational rural class. In, in Turkey, it's the, Anatoli uh, the Anatolian peasant uh, class that is becoming a bourgeoisie in India, it is similarly the rural, the, you know, outside of the Bombay Delhi phenomenon, these people becoming uh, richer and more urban, and he says, I'm with you. But there is another dynamic, of course, in India, which is the Hindu-Muslim dynamic, which Modi plays very powerfully and very cleverly and very effectively on. Uh, and if, you know, in America, the, the, the racial divide is the central dynamic in some ways in India, you know, there are probably two central dynamics, the dynamic between lower castes and upper castes and the dynamic between Hindus and Muslims. And so because Modi is able to effectively play with both of them, particularly the Hindu-Muslim one, uh, he has been, he's been more effective than anyone might have imagined. It's not an accident that his re-election with, with something uh, almost like a landslide happens on the heels of a Pakistani or apparently Pakistani inspired terrorist attack, which then allows him to unleash a very vigorous response, putting, you know, uh, and, and he cast it in very political terms. He essentially said the Congress party, you know, is, is what you will get if you want these kind of attacks and I will be the guy who defends against them. So there's always a dynamic that's different, but the fundamental reality I think is we are living in an age where people are, uh, regard these cultural changes with great disfavor. They want to return to some kind of old order that they believe, whether it's <coughs> Hindu nationalism and Hindutva in, in India, whether it's in Brazil, Bolsonaro saying we are a Catholic Christian country and how did we start doing these you know, carnivals and gay rights and all this, whether it's uh, you know, Trump saying make America great again. You know, in all of these cases, it is the return to the Garden of Eden uh, that, is the, that is the fantasy that is being, being provided, or the return to some older, more stable order in which everything, everything was somehow uh, better. Uh, you know, I, I, I look at those worlds and they don't look that great to me, but maybe I say that <laughs> you know, as somebody who, you know, in my position, but I think about the way in which people talk about those older uh, times, and if you were a woman, if you were a minority, if you were you know, somebody from the outside who didn't come from the right families, who, um, it was a much, much less uh, fair, equal uh, world. I, mean, I think that for all the cultural change that is taking place, uh, it's actually a change being produced by the reality that we are emancipating. We are allowing lots more people to fully uh, both enjoy their real legal rights, but also to actualize themselves as individuals, to be themselves and to be themselves whether they're black, white, male, female, gay, straight, um, in a way that, that they, sh they are proud of and unapologetic uh, about. And this is a great thing. And it requires a lot of negotiation and it requires, uh, it, you know, it's, it's not easy. But the people who, who, who yoke, uh, hearken back to a, to a golden age and to tell you, you know, the, uh, the problem is all those outsiders, all those others,
um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of vindictive, <laughs> zero-sum kind of politics that works in the short run, unfortunately. But you know, maybe this is the kind of uh, optimist in me. I can't believe that in the long run it'll work. I can't believe that this, you know, the people will, 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 you know, will over time not realize that the world we are living in is is one in which you, you can you have to negotiate these these differences and negotiate the reality that everybody is now sitting at the table demanding that they be heard. Thank you very much. Thank That's you. unfortunately all we have time for, but please join me in thanking Fury for coming here today.